is the Word of God and it is on the foundation of Jesus Christ, then it is your responsibility before your God to obey Him. And if it's things that you know that you have done wrong, to repent of those things, that we might all be saved in the end. When you come to the book of Jude, it's a small letter and it is so insignificant compared to other books, right? I mean, when you look at uh, big books like the book of Luke being so large about the life of Jesus Christ, and here we think about Jude, and it's only 25 verses. As I've been looking at uh, the things that have been going on in society here in the last few months, My mind was drawn to these two verses that we find in Jude that were read for us just a moment ago there in verses 10 and 11. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasonable animals, by the things they are destroying. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain and pay. They have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam perished in the rebellion of Korah. My thoughts this morning really turn to verse 11. When I think about Jude bringing these people together, putting them in one verse, how do they go together? I mean, they're not in the same time period. At least one of them is not. Cain, Cain lived centuries before Balaam and Korah. When you think about who Balaam and Korah were, Balaam was a diviner. He was not a child of Israel. He was brought uh, to curse Israel, and God would not allow him to do that. But still we find out that he is equal to Cain. He is equal to Korah. Korah, a child of God, one of the Israelites who came out of Egypt, who saw the miracles, who crossed on dry land. How is it that we see in verse 11 that it starts out, woe to them? You remember the accounts, of course, when we think about what woe to them means. It is a warning from God. It's a warning from the Holy Spirit through Jude saying, pay attention because there are similarities. One of the similarities we see is in verse 10. Notice that each of them, each of them had God touch their lives. We know Cain did. When you look at Cain, we see that he had an interaction with God one on one when his sacrifice was rejected by God. We find out that God talks to him and says, why are you angry? His attitude changed towards God. We see that God tries to help him. God tries to teach him. God tries to say, if you do well, you can accomplish the task that I want you to accomplish. But notice, if you will, in the text that we see here in Genesis chapter 4, sin is crouching at the door. And his desire is for you. And, of course, we understand what Cain does. Even though he had the instinct to know because God had told him what to do, he swells up with pride, does not obey God. And in his pride and in his selfish jealousy, he rises up and gets rid of the competition. His brother Abel. When you think about that, you think about Balaam. Balaam's in this verse. How does he fit with Cain? Well, as the ones here in the auditorium class have been learning about the Old Testament, you know about Balaam and how he was called and how God appeared to him, even speaking through a donkey to wise him up that he could not curse the Israelites. Well, he didn't stop there. He didn't learn his lesson And it's very interesting when we get to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14, we find out Jesus Christ talking to the church there at uh, Pergamum that he points this out about what Balaam does. He says there in verse chapter 2 and verse 14, I have these things against you, 
But there are some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit acts of immorality. That's exactly what we find there in Numbers chapter 25, starting there in verse 1, though we're not told who is behind it. All we find out, of course, is the children of Israel are invited in, and what they do is they play the harlot. They bow down, sacrificing to the gods of Balak. We see that they bow down to Baal of Peor. We find out, of course, that they have sexual immorality with the women there and invite them into their tents. What we see, of course, is that Balaam is one who changes it and says, well, if I can't curse them, if I can't get uh, the things from Balak that I want, then we'll invite them. We'll get them to come in. We'll show them. And so we see how he would fit with Cain as he takes a response of pride and he doesn't change his ways, but he causes Israel to sin. But also I'd have you think about there in number 16 when we think about Korah, one who was a child of God, who was a uh, one who came out of Egypt like we said. Notice what he does. You see there in Numbers chapter 16 starting there in verse 3, they assembled, they assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? Here we see Korah changing what God had already given. Korah, this child of God, is an open rebellion against God. He tries to make a new way of which God did not say to do. Moses was his chosen leader. And so when we think about, (coughs) excuse me, in verse 11, we see here, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain and pay, And for pay, they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. What do we see here? Jude is trying to get us to draw these things together because all three of these men perished. They were judged by God and they were wrong in their lifetime. And so he ties these three together. Just some of the points that I thought about for myself, that we see God's response. We see God is to be served. We learn that with Cain. We learn that with Korah. What we see with Balaam is God is able to judge the intents and the actions of mankind, and he has the authority to accept and reject, and that's exactly what we see in all three instances. We see that God gives words to obey. Balaam should have understood once once he was stopped from doing what he originally wanted to do, which was curse Israel, you thought he would have learned his lesson and changed his heart and his mind, but he did not. We also notice that God gives punishment if disobeyed. We also notice that in all three of these men, that sin's desire is for them. It can be mastered by faith in God, but none of these guys had faith in God, even though they had a direct contact with God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having a direct contact with God? Cain talked to God. Balaam talked to God. Korah saw the fire on the mountain. He saw the miracles of crossing the Red Sea. And when we think about that, we think, well, you know, if I I had that, boy, I, I, I would be faithful all the days of my life. I would not fall into the trap of what we see with these three men. These men without faith, what happens to them? Because they don't have faith in God, they become mastered by sin just like God told Cain. They become murderers, immoral, sexually uh, immoral. They have idolatry, and they just basically all three rebel against God. 
And so you can see now in verse 11 why it is that he ties these three together. But when you look at the 25 verses here in Jude, why did he write the letter? Is he telling the whole world, woe to them? He is not. He's actually writing to Christians. Go back to verse 3, if you will. Go back to verse 3. As we think about the contact that those three men had with God, how they knew it by instinct, the fact of the matter is Jude is writing this, these 25 verses to Christians because we can lose our faith if we are not careful. He says there in verse 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you, appealing to you, that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once handed uh, down to the saints. Notice, if you will, he's telling them in verse 3 that you, brethren, need to, conter, uh, need to contend earnestly for the faith. That's what we do when we go back out into the world. That's what we should be doing as we go back out into the world. We should contend earnestly for the faith. And this morning, I want to give you three examples that affect our lives and our culture and our day. And if we don't have an answer on how to talk about it, we can fall prey to the way that Cain did. We can fall prey to the way that Balaam was. We can fall prey to pride like Korah standing up in the midst and changing what God has really said. Because the things that we should do, brethren, are by God's words, and we should speak God's words. And so in doing that, we have to contend earnestly for the faith using his words. The first thing I'd like you to think about so that we will not become mastered by sin is this thought about global warming. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not talking about pollution. I am not talking about recycling. I'm not talking about whether it is better to drive a car that has a motor or has an electric motor. That's not what I'm talking about. When you look at global warming, when you look at what the so-called leaders, of which this young lady is one of them, what you see is an extremism of the earth is going to basically be destroyed. They use words like catastrophe and crisis to scare people, to get them to do whatever they want to do. Notice a quote here, and you can go on and just put in climate change quotes, and these will come up. I just picked two. Our house is still on fire. You're in action, fueling the flames by the hour. She's talking to a bunch of adults about climate change. When you look at former President Obama, a quote from him, uh, there's one issue that will define the contours of this century more dramatically than any other, and that is the urgent threat of a changing climate. I'm not even saying that climate does not change. Of course it changes. But can I tell you, brethren, that climate is God's realm. Climate is is what God wants to do. It doesn't take very long to understand this concept. Man cannot, cannot change what God wants to do. We see that at the very beginning, right, after the flood. When you look at Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21, notice that God tells us right there that Everything's going to be like it is. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat, summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. And so from the days of Noah, what has happened? From the days of Noah, the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. God's word is being fulfilled. Every day that we live, we get up in the morning and by his blessing, we see the sun. And by his blessing, we get the rain. 
And by his blessing, all the things that we experience and have experienced up to this point in our life, and what you see with <coughs> excuse me, the climate activists is the fact that we don't see any of them saying, well, think about God. Let's think about what God says. No, basically what it boils down to is that the earth is going to be destroyed. And we need to make sure that we understand what God says. When you think about James chapter 5 and you think about the verse there in verse 16, the effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. That's half of the verse. We all know that portion. What's the example that James gives? Do you remember the next verse? He says, Elijah was a man of a nature like ours and prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he, then he prayed again, and the sky poured forth rain, and the earth produced its fruit. What we see here, of course, is the fact that James, here in James chapter 5, when he's talking about prayer and the power of prayer and the things that a Christian should do, it's very interesting that he does not use an example of Abraham. He doesn't use an example of Moses. He doesn't use an example of David. But what he does is he uses an example of a man of prayer who, by the power of God, caused it to stop raining. Well, why did it stop raining? Well, it stopped raining because Israel was sinning against God, because their king was so wicked, because the queen was so wicked. And so God is trying to get them through the weather to come back to him. And when it was time to come back, we see Elijah prayed, and the rains came once again. I'd have you also think about it. Deuteronomy chapter 11, that this is what was promised to Israel. If you do well, you're going to get rain, and you're going to get what you need. This land that you've come into, which is a land flowing with milk and honey. But notice verse 16, beware that your hearts are not deceived, and that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them, or the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up heaven, so that there will be no rain, and the ground which will not yield its fruit. We see, that's exactly what Israel was told would happen, and it did happen. And you say, Keith, well, that's great. That's the Old Testament. That is Israel. Are you telling me today that God shuts up the rain? Are you telling me today that God uh, causes extreme drought because people uh, don't pay attention to him? The answer is I don't know. I know it has happened. I know that God did it in the Old Testament, but when we come to the New Testament, underneath the new covenant of Jesus Christ, what do we find out about the earth? What do we find out about weather? Well, Peter makes a comment about it in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5. In his letter that he writes, he says, For when they maintain this, escapes their notice that the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. That's what happened when the world became so corrupt and so evil. We see that it was destroyed by water. And I want you to notice what Peter says, but by his word, the present heavens and the earth are being reserved for fire for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. We must learn that God is the author over us and we must submit to his will. And God has made a reservation when we talk about this earth that it is going to be destroyed on his timetable. And the reason why it's coming is because it's a day of judgment for the destruction of ungodly men. And so we must be aware, brethren, that we will not be mastered by sin when people come talking to us about how that the earth is on fire. When God says it is not, he has a reservation for that. He will destroy it. We've got to look at the bigger picture. We've got to be ones that can turn, uh, contend earnestly for the faith and say God will handle whatever comes. 
There's going to be storms. There's going to be floods. There's going to be heat. There's going to be cold. There's going to be seed time. There's going to be harvest. There's going to be day and night until God says there's not going to be any more. We cannot get ourselves trapped into following this type of logic and leave God out. We have to be a people of prayer who rely on God and trust on God no matter what person over here in the world is standing up and saying, no, follow me. And if you also think about what we see in our world today, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, transgenderism is my feeling to choose. It is a shame that the state of Florida had to make a law, isn't it? Not to teach sexual education up to the third grade. It's a shame that the state of Florida had to make a law that stopped at the third grade. Let me tell you, brethren, throughout the world, this has gone on. We read it there on the pages of the New Testament, do we not? We read about the fornication, the adultery, the homosexuality. We see it throughout, and God warns against it. You can't have a feeling to choose whether you are a boy or whether you are a girl because it goes against God's will. God made you who you are. And don't, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. We all have temptations. We all have temptations. They had temptations in the first century. We all have a temptation towards something, and your temptation may not be the same as my temptation. But, guys, what we are trying to do is not to be mastered by sin because mastered, being mastered by sin causes the destruction of our souls and what we must do is we must stand on the word of God and say this is what it is this is what it is now I've got to get an agreement with it no matter how hard no matter how difficult no matter if it causes me to lose friends family whomever I want you to think about Matthew chapter 19 we know God's point of view we know it It, it's not even a question that we have to uh, look at and, and, and study and try to draw some necessary influence to what did God create we see here when they are uh, when Jesus is asked the question in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 3 some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason and he answered and said have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so that they are no longer two but one flesh What therefore God has created together, let no man separate. What did God create? Man and woman. That's all. Nothing else. Man and woman. They didn't get to choose. I didn't get to choose that I was a male. I just woke up one day and about five years old, I guess, and realized I was a male. Right? My parents had been telling me that I I was a boy. What's going to happen in life? Well, if you choose to get married, then you are going to choose the opposite. You're going to choose a man choosing a woman or a woman choosing a man, and you're going to come together. That's your choice. See, leaving out all other things about how you feel doesn't make any difference. Jesus has told us how it is and how far does it go back. It goes back to the very beginning, does it not? It is prideful to try to define what God has already defined and redefine it in the way that I want to feel about it. That is what Jude is talking about. And what we find in verse 11 is, Woe to them, because all sexual perversions go against God's 
word. All of them. Notice here that they are equal. And we're going to see it a little bit later on in 1 Corinthians. But lastly, I want to talk to you about what has been in the news for the last couple of weeks. Abortion. Abortion is not murder because it's just not a child. We change the term. We say it's a fetus or uh, we might not even call it that now. People are coming up with all different types of definitions and things I can't keep up with. But what it boils down to is my right to choose. It's my right to choose. It's my body. We see people on the news marching through the streets cheering for abortion and that is so sad that is so sad because God has defined what pregnancy is you ever thought about that in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18 when we it is announced to us about Jesus Notice, if you will, it says in verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now, some versions say she was pregnant. Okay, let's not argue about words just because the version says just pregnant. Let's go on. It says, And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. When he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, as you look at that scripture, you find out exactly God's point of view, do you not? What is Mary pregnant with? A child. What is told is going to be born a son. So what does that mean? Well, that means a pregnant woman has a child in the womb and has a child out of the womb, does it not? And you want to go back and look. Look at the the scripture, the prophecy from Isaiah. What did they view it as? God had already spoken there 700 years earlier. It's a child. It's a son. His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. Guys, it's not that hard to understand, but but we can get fooled by the devil and by his forces, and we can forget about what God says. So the truth of the matter is, brethren, it is a murder to kill a child or an adult for your own selfish reasons. That's what we see with Cain. And let me be very uh, sympathetic here. Because there are times where we find out things about the child in the womb. Very difficult things about a child. And when medical knowledge gives that to us, there can be times of a thought about stating, well, the child's not going to live. This is going to be the end result I want you to think about that if you take the life of that child that you're not letting God do any blessing whatsoever you've made the decision we've got to let God do his thing we cannot cut short God and what is going on we're going to have to trust him that's what living the christian life is all about it's about making difficult decisions it's about going against the grain it's about putting up with things that other people don't have to put up with 
If we stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ, our cornerstone, then God will make it all turn out for the good, for his glory. And that's what we live life for, right? Isn't that what we're trying to do? And that's the reason why Jude is writing this to us. And some will say, well, what about when there's a situation of rape? That seems where it always goes to, the extreme position. Awful. I can't, I, I can't imagine that happening to one of my daughters. But I'll tell you exactly what I've already told them. Guys, don't add to the sin. Don't add to the sin. God can create good out of bad. We read it over and over and over in the scriptures. Don't make the decision for God. Let him work. Let him be a blessing. I know it can happen because it has happened to me. When you think about what we see in the scriptures about what we are talking about today, we see all of these things. And sin, its desire is for you. Its desire is for me. Its desire is for everyone in this audience that has the age to reason between good and bad. But our story is not finished. Cain and Balaam and Korah's story is finished. Woe to them. They have marched off into destruction because of their heart. But what we see in the account of Cain, God talking to him, he's saying the same thing to us. Sin can be mastered if one is willing to master it by faith in our God. I know that is true because when I look at passages like 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, it says there, as you go through, whoever believes that Jesus Christ is born of God and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this, we know that the love of the children of God and when we love God and observe his commandments, for this is the love of God and we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Guys, that's what is going to get us to where God wants us to be. Our faith, our trust in our God. Isn't that what Jude is saying in verse 3 that we already read? I felt it necessary to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. God wants us to be saved. That's the reason why Jesus Christ came to this earth. That is the reason why he lived and put up with all the temptations, all the trials, all the pain and the suffering that our brother John brought to us this morning in such an excellent way, giving of his life so that we can have life in him. So let me tell you some more good news about this. Is that if you have been mastered by sin, you don't have to be mastered anymore. That the power of Jesus Christ is still available today like it was available in the days of Jude in that first century. And with time, it has not been watered down whatsoever. Maybe you have been mastered by sin. Maybe you have been a murderer the apostle paul was a murderer but he was saved you can be saved too maybe you are a person that has been caught up in sexual sin of fornication or adultery or homosexuality can i tell you that god is willing to forgive you too that's what we see with the Corinth brethren that paul writes about he says there in verse I, verse six uh, Chapter 6 and verse 9, if I can get it out. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexualities, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Woe to them is what Paul is saying there, agreeing with what Jude writes here in verse 11. But he doesn't stop there. 
he gives us in verse 11, his verse 11 here in 1 Corinthians, great news. When he says, so, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Isn't that wonderful news? That today you can be washed from sin and be changed to be what God wants you to be. What does God want? He wants you to be sanctified because he wants to set you apart for his service. That's what happened to these Corinthians. When they were mastered by sin, they came to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They came and repented of their sins when they understood they were against God. They didn't have pride in their heart. They said, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it in my thinking. What they came and did was they repented of that sin. And they confessed that Jesus Christ is going to be the Lord of their life. He's going to be their master from that day on. And then they submitted to baptism. They were washed. That's what Paul is talking about here. They were cleansed by God in the blood of the Lamb because the blood of the Lamb does what? As we learned this morning, it brings life. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins, no matter how bad and how awful and how nasty and how long it's been on you. Jesus Christ can cleanse every sin. But you've got to humble yourselves before God. And when you do that, God raises you up and you are different. You are changed. You are not the way you were before. You are sanctified and you are justified. God says that person is no longer guilty. Not guilty. We understand these things. But have we been really contending earnestly for the faith? Did you do it last week? When we think about these things that we have talked about today, did you, did you just give in and say, well, it just doesn't really make any difference? Yes, it does make a difference. It makes a difference when you stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ every time. When you show the world who Jesus Christ is, it makes a difference. When you just don't get into the fray. Let me tell you, when we contend earnestly for the faith, brethren, we've got to do it in a Christ-like way too. You might have been standing up for Christ, but maybe you have been ugly about standing up for Christ. Maybe you've been typing things on the Internet that, that, that oh, I'm just so angry, they're just going to get me, and I'm going to just cut them down. Is that the Christ-like way? Is it really, guys? There are times where Christ was very loving. There are times when Christ was very strong. And, guys, we've got to be like Jesus Christ. Let's make sure we stay in his lane on his foundation as we contend earnestly for the faith. And sometimes that is very hard. Sometimes it is very difficult when you want to just lash out with your tongue or with your thumb and say really ugly things to people. But you know what part of being a Christian is? Being under what? Self-control of Jesus Christ. And so maybe you find yourself this morning in a place where you know that you have been mastered by sin. We see that Jesus tells us, or excuse me, that John tells us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All you got to do is confess what you have done. God loves us so much that he wants to forgive us all of the time. He wants us to get better because he does not want us to be mastered by sin because he wants us to live in a place that he has created, a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So I would encourage you this week that as you go back out into the world, that you remember what Jude tells us. He tells us, woe to them. But also remember your purpose in life. 
which is to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. Live a life for Jesus Christ. But if you're not a member of the body of Christ, I hope this day you will come as we're going to sing this invitation song together. The greatest news, grace that is greater than all our sins. God wants you to come today. Don't put it off any longer because we're not promised tomorrow. Not it, no, don't let it be said about you. Woe to them, for they knew what to do, and they were unwilling to do it. If you have any needs, let it be known now as we stand and sing. I'm